Hey, everybody, it's Scott Steen with winnersandwiners.com coming to you with the Tuesday edition of the Today in Sports Betting. As always, I'm joined by my co-host coming from the East Coast there in Long Island, keeping it real on the island. He is the one and only Scott Reichel. Scott, happy Tuesday, buddy. How you doing? Uh, doing pretty well. Uh, it's going to be nice talking about some NFL stuff with you. Uh, I was pretty busy yesterday. Besides the uh, UFC video that we ended up making, I also wrote some articles for the a winners in Winers website on the main card in the prelims for UFC Fight Night 171. So if you want to check that out, you can. But pretty some of it's so repetitive from what I was talking about in yesterday's video. But I also mentioned some props. I gave a little bit of a deeper breakdown. So if you're really interested in more UFC coverage, I got you covered there. Other than that, though, uh, yeah, we were talking off the air before about some alleged uh, baseball proposals to potentially get uh, everything back to normal, at least to some degree with the start of a baseball season around July. So, you know, right. a lot of stuff happening. I mean, it's been roughly two months, and it's kind of crazy when you think about it that it's been roughly 60 days, but that's just the reality of what we live in. Well, I'll tell you what, that 60 days has gone by. It just seems like about four or five years. So. Yes, it does. Yes. Sometimes go by fast. Some, uh, some other times it does not. It's been very slow, and the one thing I did notice is that it's a lot easier for me to go to bed later at night when you have sports on television at roughly one in the morning, because it seems like one of the situations I had the same experience when I was in California, when I was visiting colleges, I'd say like five, six years ago, is that when I was there, all the sporting events were three hours ahead of where, I, of what I was used to because of the West coast time zone. So every right. game was starting at like four and all the late games finished at 10 o'clock and I had nothing to do past 10 o'clock because all I cared about was sports and that's what I feel like I'm in now where it's 10 o'clock and I'm wondering why am I staying up so late what am I supposed to be doing where I know normally I'd be like oh yeah that's right you have the random worst team in the league warriors who are playing the kings and that's randomly on TNT till 1 30 in the morning I gotta watch that you know what I mean like I'm making excuses to stay up to watch sporting events and now you don't have to do that you can just uh are you sorry do you find yourself going to bed earlier no, that's the problem, is that I'm still stuck in the same sleep schedule. I'm stuck in limbo. I've just been replacing my time with online poker. But it's, I don't know. It's something that I found a lot, I'd say, more natural in all the wrongest ways that I was staying up later than I probably should be because I was watching pointless sporting events. And now you have people doing it to the extreme where they're going to bed early just to wake up at 5 a.m. for Korean baseball. I can't say I'm doing that, but I'm sure people have been doing that around the world. Absolutely. Um, Scott, just, just a quick question. Have you ever thought about dating anybody? <laughs> that is an option. However, you know, I like to believe I'm trying to make the planet safer by, uh, you know, not exposing anybody to corona or not exposing <laughs> myself to corona. So as far as anybody's concerned, that's the, uh, that's the excuse I've been using for why I haven't really been doing anything. Fair enough. Fair enough. And, uh, yeah, we'll talk about this at the beginning. Scott brings up a good point. I always wait till the end to plug the Winners and Winners site, so I'll do it at the beginning this time. Make sure you stop by and check out winnersandwiners.com and our sister site over there at statsalt.com. Still keeping out, still cranking out the great, relevant content. Uh, it's uh, taking a look at all the sports that are still going on. And, of course, a, a couple of pieces, just like we're doing here on the sports that we anticipate to be going on, like the NFL. So. Uh, yeah, definitely check out Scott's stuff over there at winnersandwinners.com. And if you uh, missed the show yesterday, uh, really some, Scott had some great breakdowns on the UFC card. I'm kind of learning as I go. I will never pretend to be the UFC expert, but luckily we do have a couple of them here on staff. And one it's, of them an even, it's an even trade because you're teaching me some uh, WWE <laughs> stuff and I'm teaching <laughs> some MMA stuff. So we'll call it even, and I think that's why it works out between us. Fair enough. Uh, and I think we both enjoy a fine, fine game of NFL football. So let's take a look today, starting off with the NFC receivers. We're going to do the AFC receivers tomorrow. And uh, then uh, as far as our schedule goes, we're going to do our UFC show on Thursday. And then we're going to take a look. We're going to change it up a little bit on Friday, take a look at where the various sports leagues are with uh, their plans to restart or – uh, continue, well, restart, or uh, start the season uh, due to the coronavirus. Then we'll talk about uh, really the big, what I would call the big five, uh, NHL, football, baseball, uh, NBA, and uh, college football. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, see, we'll see where each of those land, and it's some interesting things 
doing the research, I know it's, it's going to be a fun show too. So with that being said, let's start off with the, uh, with the NFC receivers. Scott, you won the coin toss today. Go ahead and go first. Uh, well, tails never fails. So with that being said, uh, I'm going to start out with uh, – I think I feel like it would only be fitting if I started out with the person who actually led the entire NFL in receiving yards last year in Michael Thomas. Last year recorded over 1,700 yards. He was phenomenal. Uh, he set the record for most receptions in a single season with 149. Uh, for that reason, though, I actually love the under here, uh, which is available shop around. Drafting is currently as under 1,500 and a half at minus 121, where Foxbet has over 1,399 and a half. So you get roughly 100 yards of extra. Like, woo! It's minus woo! 100 yard no. middle. That's 100 yard middle right there. Those are definitely nice to come by uh, with both sides being at 121 or less. So that's definitely, you're not paying that much juice for a nice middle opportunity. But for mm. me, my favorite out of those two, I'd have to take the under 1,500 and a half just because of the fact that last year was so absurd that I think it's almost impossible to duplicate. I know that you can say, well, there's still a 200 yard difference. So even odds makers are expecting a little bit of regression, but just to put it into comparison, the person that Michael Thomas beat for the uh, single season career reception record was Marvin Harrison, who back in 2002 with the Indianapolis Colts ended up recording 143 receptions and over 1700 yards the following season, Marvin Harrison barely broke 1,200 yards. So you had roughly a 500-yard, uh, I'd say, downgrade the following season, and he also recorded 49 less receptions. So based on history, there's usually massive regression due, and I simply think that Michael Thomas is going to still be a phenomenal receiver. But I think that the numbers he put up are just – I don't want to say an anomaly – but they're basically impossible. I'm not really sure how you can do put up anywhere near the same level of production. I think Thomas should finish somewhere in the realm of 100 catches for probably around, I'd say, high 1300s. So for that reason, I would personally take the under on 1500 and a half at minus 121. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I'll tell you another reason there that uh, Sanders is likely to have a little, or that uh, Thomas is likely to have a little regression. And it is Emmanuel Sanders, again, receiver that they signed. Uh, from the San Francisco 49ers, uh, formerly of the Denver Broncos. A very, very good, you know, not quite an elite receiver, but certainly a low one or a high two. Um, certainly good enough to take a few of the targets away from uh, Michael Thomas. I believe that Sanders probably will have somewhere in the uh, I don't know, 70 range, 70, 70 to 80 catches would be my guess. And those catches have to come from somewhere, and I believe at least a few of them are going to come from uh, Michael Thomas and the incredible season that he had. So, yeah, I like the uh, – I like that play quite a bit. Are you interested? It was interesting to see you and I – what's that? Go ahead. I was gonna, Sorry to interrupt. I was going to ask, are you – how do you feel about playing middles with receivers? Are you more comfortable with other positions? Or how does that work with middles? Or do you just think anything of value of triple digits in terms of yards from any position is just worth it? Well, I'm always going to look at it as far as how, what kind of percentage the middle offers is, uh, you know, like to, to what percentage 100 is of the top end. But, um, yeah, when you're talking about uh, what, that's going to be, what, a 6.5% middle there at 1,500? Yeah, I'm going to play that all day long. I, I like I, – I will. T I'm an opportunist. I don't really care about the position. Um, I'm, going to look at, I'm going to look at the numbers. I'm going to look at the juice. Uh, what am I paying extra to get that middle? And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be a case by case basis. Yeah, I don't well, eliminate. Yeah, I posted a middle on my uh, Twitter. I'd say about a week ago or so on Lamar <laughs> Jackson rushing yards because it's even the smaller the number is and the bigger disparity you can get. Of course, the higher the percentage is going to be for the middle that you're taking. There's about 130 yards available for Lamar Jackson rushing yards in a middle, and both numbers are around like 1,100 or a 1, thousand. 130 yard middle there that's insane this is also it's not as good as that one I think that one is another world in terms of value for uh for arbitrage but at the end of the day 100 plus yard about 100 yards give or take that for a receiver that's definitely value that you should look for every time yeah and just to give a little point of reference here if you're if you're paying uh say 120 or less, you know, you're going to be able to make a profit at arbitrage um, with a, with a 
two to three percent middle. So mm -hmm. uh, to find to find something that's double digits, uh, find a ten percent middle like that. That's as you, it is absolutely insane. Now it is worth mentioning, as we've said before, that arbitrage is not guaranteed money because there is a chance that you're going to win one of the two and you're going to lose the juice. So you might lose a little bit on the end. But if you have the possibility of basically risking what maybe an eighth of a unit if you lose one of the two in comparison to right. winning like what five units if you hit a middle, I mean that's that's worth every time. You're basically getting a single bet of a plus four digit odd situation there. I don't know how you don't take that every time. No, you just you just gotta hit, you know, if you're paying eight percent or whatever, you just gotta hit one in eleven, um, basically to make it profitable. So mm -hmm. yeah. Uh that's how that's how that break that's how that breaks down. So yeah, it's uh now. Having said that, we want to make sure that you guys know the caveat that that's the, the, probably the best way to get banned from your sports book is to uh, constantly uh, make uh, arbitrage part of your uh, part of your daily routine. So, well, there are ways uh, around it though, because hypothetically, there are ways around it though, and a lot of sites won't be able to pick up on arbitrage if you're not betting both sides on the same site. So, for example, right. if you are betting the Michael Thomas that I just said on. Fox bet over thirteen ninety nine and under fifteen hundred on DraftKings. They're gonna have no idea that you're doing arbitrage because they're just gonna think that you have one strong opinion about one specific player prop. It's so the if the issue you run into. I know William Hill has been known for banning some people that have done arbitrage. If you do the same site on both sides in a spread or a total or something, then they might give your account a little bit of extra attention. But if you're spreading it amongst other sports bet uh, sports books, they're not going to communicate with each other about your your accounts that they're competing with each other. That wouldn't make any sense. So my advice to you is if you plan on doing arbitrage or you plan on doing middling or whatever you want to call it, try to spread it around multiple sites. That's my advice. For yeah, you. I agree. And you know, just for the record, I think there's more communication between those sites than we probably want to know. There could um, be. I think but I'm that just there's saying. A, especially offshore. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, how your more legitimate sites, you know, necessarily yeah. communicate. I don't know how CGI communicates with William Hill, for example, but um, yeah. And you also have to be aware that a lot of times some of those, uh, uh, especially when you're talking about legitimate books are they are owned or controlled by the same companies. Yeah. So, well, just to reiterate, even though we talked before about how, Oh, you know, they can hypothetically freeze your account or stuff like that or flag it just to reiterate, it's not illegal. You're not in danger of violating anything. They would simply no, no. consider flagging you because you found loopholes in their system. Yeah, so in like, other words, like, what you said isn't wrong. They just are aware that they're, you're, more, you're more likely to win money on their site than lose money on their site. So they might not necessarily want you, but that's their problem. Yeah, it's like counting cards. It's, uh, uh, it's yeah. not illegal, but mm -hmm. you can certainly get... Uh, get your action limited or uh, get your action banned from that particular casino. Mm -hmm. So, um, Scott, I'm going to start with one of my favorites here. And it always is fun when Scott and I do these shows because I know this kind of come as a big shock to people, but we don't really rehearse them. So we don't know what each other's list is going to be in advance. It's always curious to see uh, who's going to be on his list and what his takes are and vice versa. So I'm going to go uh, with, with my number one pick here. And it's a, it's going to be uh, surprisingly, it's going to be Allen Robinson of the Chicago Bears, Scott. Uh, I've got him at over 1180 receiving yards uh, last year. Got 90, got 98 balls for 1147. But here's the deal: there is absolutely no one else on the Bears to throw to, uh, with the exception of probably Anthony Miller. Uh, they have a below-average running game. They have quarterbacks that are anxious to prove themselves. Uh, you have one elite uh, or one you know I'm not even going to call Allen Robinson an elite receiver you have one good receiver on the Chicago Bears and he is Allen Robinson I like the over 1180 and a half receiving yards for him well what if I told you that Fox bet has 1099 <laughs> and a half at minus 110 well there you go so we've got another so we've got another uh, middle of uh, over over 80 yards so 81 yard middle there mm -hmm. so if you wanted to go uh, what kind of juice are you paying on that Minus one ten. Wow. Okay. No, oh, that's good. That's that's uh, eh, it's certainly going to be tempting. Now, so what do you think? You like uh, you, you like that you like that play? 
Uh, the truth is, is that I'm going to have to pass. I actually do love Allen Robinson as a receiver and as a talent, and I still remember him out of Penn State. But until I actually know, once again, who the starting quarterback is for the Bears, I don't really know if I can make this wager. Now, of course, I think we both agree you'd feel a lot more confident with this bet if Foles is the day one starter onward because he's more willing to throw the ball downfield which is what Allen Robinson is, I'd say, relatively known for. And Trubisky's more of a check down Charlie, so to speak, where he is kind of afraid to throw the ball downfield. We both think that Trubisky's going to be starting week one. I know that odds makers believe that Foles are going to be starting week one, but we're kind of in the minority there at a plus price. I would personally wait until you actually find out who the quarterback is going to be None of these lines should really be shifting anytime soon. Is that a fair, uh, uh, I'd say, statement on that? Yeah, there's, not, there's, nothing, there's nothing that would cause that shift other than action. Nobody's, uh, you know, nobody's coming to the forefront in, uh, in OTAs or uh, anything like that. So, yeah, there should be very little movement um, on these plays. So if it's something that you want to check and see, uh, start to get a lean toward the quarterback there, certainly feel free. I personally don't care. Uh, like I said, he went for 11.47 last year. And I think Chase Daniel started three games, maybe. I believe he was in roughly. I feel better if it's Foles. But yeah. I think Allen Robinson is going to get his um, either way. I think way. Chase Daniel so. was starter for around a game and a half, I think. I think it was roughly a game. and It wasn't good. But I know he started because Trub- – he didn't start. He came off the bench because Trubisky got injured in the first quarter of one game. Then he started another game and he was terrible. And then I believe he started maybe a half after that, and he got benched. It really wasn't a good situation. How do you start, how do you start a half? Uh, you come in in the first half, and then uh, I think they just benched him at halftime because he was terrible. Who replaced him? Trubisky, I thought. Oh, you think? Okay, now I'm going to I could have sworn right. that Chase Daniel got benched midway through a game because he was terrible. I'm pretty By sure. By the way, do, do we get – do we go through the amount of money that Chase Daniel has made? Uh, we have actually in the past. It's, uh, it's a pretty penny. <laughs> it's, right there. it's incredible that what, what he has made. Quarterbacks might not have been great in the NFL, but him and Blaine Gabbard have earned a decent paychecks in their time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at least, you know, Chase Daniel had some, had some success in, the, uh, in uh, his college career. Blaine Gabbard was, never really even had success – in the college ranks. So it was, uh, yeah, interesting to see. Oh, all right. So, okay. Uh, again, eh, I don't care. I don't, I don't, I, it doesn't matter to me whether it's going to be um, Nick Foles, uh, Chase Daniel. <laughs> it's not going to be Chase Daniel, but uh, uh, Nick Foles, you know, didn't Chase Daniel sign with Chicago? Uh, I believe he did. Uh, I can't say that I can confirm that because I, Honestly, don't really know the answer to that, but that does sound familiar. So, so, and that was one of the games that he started, I, I believe, as he started against the, the Detroit Lions, which was dreadful. So he did start one game. You're right. But he, he played it. He played and he got into uh, three. He got in, in into three games I and said, started I one at halftime in this third game. Because he I came. In know, a, how do you uh, how do you bench the back? Uh, well, because Trubisky. So what? what uh, Trubisky, I think the point was that Trubisky was quote, he what? Trubisky was quote unquote injured, so they let Daniel start, and then I guess they realized Trubisky was healthy, but they were going to stick with Daniel anyway, kind of like a Kaepernick, uh, Alex Smith situation, except Chase Daniel was terrible, and I guess they realized even though Trubisky isn't good, he's technically healthy, so we can throw him back out there. That didn't help. Either, but... Is it like the scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail where they said the guy's dead, and I'm not dead yet? Yes. Feeling- uh, yes. Bring out your dead. Yeah, it's basically what happened. Basically, it's not that but okay. that's a pretty good comparison to what happened there. But uh, <laughs> oh, there you go. All right, fair enough. So yeah, don't care. Like Alan Robinson, who you got next on your list? So I'm actually going to be talking. There is no middle in this situation because they're actually about a yard apart. But I'm going to be looking at the uh, everyone's favorite Super Bowl bet, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I'm actually going to be looking at Chris Godwin here. And his number is currently at 12.50 and a half on DraftKings. And I like the under. I think that number is just simply too high. If you are looking at how he did last year, Godwin ended up finishing third in the NFL in receiving yards with over 1,300 yards. 
I'm still a little bit concerned about the starting quarterback for the Buccaneers, not in terms of success, because I know that Brady is a multiple-time Super Bowl champion. I know he's arguably the greatest quarterback of all time. I know he's significantly better than Jameis Winston. But when it comes to passing yards or receiving yards, wouldn't you agree you'd kind of rather have Jameis Winston back there because he'll throw the ball downfield no matter what? Yeah, I had both of these guys on my list, and I really, I just really wanted to throw them out there for a discussion. I, I, I probably lean towards the under on both Godwin and Evans. Uh, by the way, points bet had Godwin at two sixty and a half. So okay, if you wanted the ten yard middle, you got one. There. But uh, yeah, yeah um, with 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 those guys, Winston for all of his faults, he did average eight point two yards per attempt last he season. Over five thousand uh, yards. Right, right. Not afraid to throw the ball downfield. On the other hand, Brady. Um, up there in New England, averaged just 6.6 yards per attempt, which is actually higher than I thought it was going to be. Uh, but still, uh, it will be interesting to see Tommy Terrific with a more talented cast of receivers. I think that's arguably one of the top duos in the league. We're going to talk about another one here in a minute. But um, Godwin and Evans, out of the two of them, do you like Godwin to go under better than you like Evans to go under? Do you think there's a difference between the two? Um, points bet has him at 10 yards difference. Mike Evans, 250, Chris Godwin, 260. If I had both of these guys are lucky. Yeah. If I had to personally pick one of them to go over, I would pick Mike Evans just because I think Mike Evans is the better player. I know that Godwin's going up against, I'd say worse cornerbacks because he's technically the number two receiver. It's also tricky because you have Gronk, OJ Howard is still there. They still have Cameron Bray. There's a lot of weapons and there's only one ball. So you also have to worry about if Godwin's going to get enough touches to even go over this, let alone the reduction in yards per reception because Brady's going to be willing to make the right read and he's not going to be afraid to chuck it down if he needs to. For me, after watching what Tom Brady, I know it was in his prime, but after watching what he did with a true number one receiver in Randy Moss and how he wasn't afraid to chuck it up there, I think he's not going to be afraid to chuck it up in one-on-one situations to Mike Evans. I love Evans. I think Evans is a phenomenal receiver. And in terms of his overall production, you can make the argument that he's on pace to be one of the most underrated receivers of all time. I yeah. think Evans is significantly better than Godwin as a receiver. I think Godwin's still very solid. But if I had to lean over to one of them, I'm taking the elite receiver in Mike Evans. So I feel more confident taking the under with Godwin. How do you feel? Now, Mike Evans does have the, the better peripherals. Um, yeah, well – he had, he had 11.57 last year, but in just 13 games, still averaged 17.3 yards per catch, which was fantastic. Uh, Godwin, on the other hand, played 14 games, 13.33, 15 and a half. So, yeah, so well, Evans still very good numbers. What, like uh, not quite. Uh, yeah, if you average, uh, like I said, 30, so he's at about to, what, 90 yards a game. So he put another 270 on there. So he put him. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood, yeah, four, four, 14 and change. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So he was on pace to have a better year than Godwin last year. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. For that reason, um, I'd lean to uh, – plus, I know Godwin's a very good receiver. Is he really a jump ball guy? Uh, I, well, he, doesn't, he doesn't have the size that Evans, I don't think, just anecdotally. Cool. I, so I, I like Evans a little the, bit more for the over because even when he's covered, he's not fully covered, if you know what I mean. He can now, go. would you just pick one of? Would you just pick one of these plays, or would you pick Evans over Godwin under? The truth is, I'm more confident with taking Godwin under than taking Evans with anything, because Evans has that health issue, okay. which has been an issue. But right. I, I know for a fact that Evans, when healthy, has been so consistent when it comes to yards. I believe he's had over a thousand yards in every single season that he's been in the league. He's been absolutely insane. So it's not a matter of him having a down year. He never has a down year. And I feel like even though Brady might be a little bit more prone to throwing it short, at the end of the day, you get Mike Evans on one-on-one coverage, you might just chuck it up there. And I don't think that you have the same confidence in doing the same with Chris Godwin. No, at least not this, at this stage in his career. It's possible right. that he turn into an elite receiver. But I think uh, you and I both agree that Mike Evans is already there. Um, yeah, that was uh... – I'm I'm with you. I would probably uh, – uh, I, I don't think I, – I just don't think they're each going to – you know, they, they combined for uh, – for last for last year, they, they combined for about 2,500 yards. And I don't think that's going to happen again this year uh, with trying to keep Gronk happy. And uh, O.J. Howard, who's, you know, a very, very fine tight end in his, in his own right, probably 
can we say better than Gronk at this point in his career? It's tough because O.J. Howard was such a non-factor last year, but I think Gronk is such an uncertainty that I'm not, everyone's just penciling him in, saying, oh, he's clearly going to go for 1,000 yards. And I'm just like, what are you even talking about? He's probably going to go for maybe, I don't know, I'd say 600, maybe. I saw, you know, I saw the prop on Gronk, and I don't remember what it was, but I want to say it was around 670, six in the 600 somewhere. Six, 619 and a half on six nineteen. That sounds was. right to me. That sounds right to me. All right, fair enough. All right. Uh, by the way, if I had to play that, I, uh, I don't know. I'd, I'd probably take a slot lead to the un, to the over, because you're looking at what forty yards a game to get to six forty. Uh, I don't know. I'm, yeah. I, that's why I didn't write it down. But I'm all the casual touch. fans are talking about how Gronk is suddenly going to turn the Buccaneers into an official Super Bowl contender, and I think that's a laugh. Well, that's still like, yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's ridiculous. My thoughts on that. All right, so I'm going to take a look at one of my favorite all-time uh, – or one of my favorite receivers here as far as an up-and-comer goes. I think this guy is going to be elite in the next two or three years, and that is DK Metcalf of the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, they've got DK at uh, 999 and a half. So basically, if he gets 1,000 yards, it's going to hit the over here. Uh, I think he is poised, like I said, to be an elite receiver in this league. He has great size, 6'4", 230. Um, of course, Tyler Lockett is still – going to get the attention of the number one receiver there at least for at least to begin the season and I think DK Metcalf is going to be absolutely able to take advantage of that I think Russell Wilson is only going to trust him more and more I think his skills improve and if uh, if not this year very very soon I think he is going to be a top 10 receiver in the NFL I like to meet some DK Metcalf right here they don't have they still don't have much of a running game I know they've got uh, uh, they're talking about uh, Marshawn Lynch coming back well, Carson and to come back from injury. I know they got Carson coming back off an injury. I'm just not certain. So how I'm not so certain how that's going to work out. I think Russell Wilson wants to throw the ball down the field. I like uh, I like DK Metcalf over a grand here. Your thoughts? Yeah. So just a quick uh, question here. You said the number was at nine ninety nine and a half. Yes, sir. Okay. So DraftKings has eight seventy five and a half at minus one ten. Man, that there's is there's a lot of middles here. Shop around. Oh. Yeah, that's that's you know that's even if, even if I believe in his skills, that's almost worth a sniff just because of injuries, just because of unforeseen circumstances. Something happens to him. Something happens to Wilson. Um, you know, something happens uh, to Lockett. You know, maybe. I, yeah, that's it, less than a thousand yards at a hundred and twenty-five yard gap. That's it's impossible not to play. So and, I mean, that's one thing that is worth mentioning here is that it is tr a tricky situation. <laughs> when it comes to going for middles now. And the reason why is because you're not even sure when the season's going to start and you have to tie right. down some of your bankroll over a decent period of time for a shot at winning one of these. I mean, 125 yards for receivers projected less than 1,000, according to both markets. Ridiculous. I, that's just – I mean, that's the double-digit middles that we're talking about in terms of wow. – that, that's a gift. Right there. Yeah, it is. And no matter how much you, no matter how much you believe in your boy, like I believe in DK Metcalf to go over eight seventy five, uh, the math says you got to play that. Plus, so, if it's less than sixteen games, it's going to be canceled anyway, so you just get your money back. Yeah, I wonder how that's going to. I wonder how that is going to go if they do play less than sixteen games. I'm, Draft, I'm sure. I, you know, DraftKings on all of their player props says on the side of the bet slip. Must go all eight, 16 games. Must have 16 okay. regular season. I don't know if other books have that same rule, but DraftKings says it exclusively. So Everything else. Keep it no going. action. Yeah. For Metcalf, though, I agree with you, though. I'll use the number 875 and a half. Mm -hmm. I, like, I love the under. I love the over as well. Uh, he had 900 last year. And as we all know, he had a little bit of issues with regard to the drops in the regular season. He seemed to drop right. a couple passes, fumble the ball here and there. And then he set the record for the most uh, receiving yards by a rookie in the history of the NFL postseason. Uh, so against the Eagles. So yeah, I think Russell Wilson trusts him because of that. And uh, I think he should probably go for over a K. At the end of the day, though, if I had to lean more towards the over 875 or the under 999 and a half, I'd easily take the over 875. I think that's one of the best bets on the board. But I yeah. feel like you kind of have to play the middle there. Yeah, I'm the same way. I and I really liked it. I like the over at a thousand. So imagine how much I like it at eight seventy five. I still think you got to play the middle. You just can't pass up that kind of mathematical opportunity. 
Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's really not much else to say. That's a line that I feel like the odds makers have completely butchered. I feel like that line should be closer to around a thousand, give or take. I don't know how they. Ex- I don't know how Fox Bet ex- expects him to do worse than he did last year. After he went for 900 last year and his numbers at 875, I'm not really sure how that makes any sense. But yeah, uh, to me. I'm not going to complain. I'm just going to take it. Take it and smile. Um, who else you got? Uh, so looking through, just to be clear, I don't know how many receivers uh, points bet has. Fox bet has a ton of wide receivers. And if you are interested in taking wide receiver props, I'd recommend Fox bet. They have – Pretty much, they have. I can't, I'm trying to count the amount of people here. It's got to be somewhere north of 70. They have a ton of wide receivers, so that is worth mentioning there. Okay. Uh, there's another middle here that I'm actually going to be mentioning. I mentioned it before in my uh, rookie wide receiver props. I love the CD Lamb over, and the reason why I love the over is because Foxbet has the number at 774 and a half, and DraftKings has the number at 700 and a half. So with the 74-yard middle there, I'm going to take the over 700. I simply put, I know that he's a rookie. I know that he might not have a full offseason of, uh, you know, programs and everything like that. At the end of the day, C.D. Lamb might be matched up against your cornerback three. And I think that's a disaster. Plus, you're playing indoors most likely in Dallas. We know that Dak can throw the ball around. Whether or not he's the Cowboys actually want to pay him or not, we know that he can actually throw the ball. I just think this number's too low. I think Lamb's going to run into the NFL. I think we can agree Lamb should be pretty solid, especially in that system. I don't know how Lamb doesn't go for less than I don't. Know, I mean, for less than what seven fifty, give or take. I've got, I've got Lamb. On, I got Lamb on my list too at seven seventy five and a half. So yeah. I, I at seven hundred and a half, I got to take the over there. Oh, uh, all day. Yeah. You know, Randall Cobb, who uh, I had to be reminded actually played for Dallas last year, had 828 yards. Yeah. So and Lamb has the ability to go up and get it in one-on-one coverage and a deep pass. Right. Cobb can't even do that. So I'd, I'd have to assume, even though Cooper is the best receiver on the roster, can we agree – and eh, Gallup's pretty good from a deep pass perspective. Can we agree CeeDee Lamb's probably the biggest deep threat on the roster? Yeah, uh, as long as he uh, is, as long as he shows the ability to uh, to run the run his routes correctly, I think he I think he will be. Yeah, it's, that's what uh, I'm saying. So you might have a couple of sixty something yard touchdown receptions there, which are definitely going to help you out. Because any yeah. about it, a seventy yard touchdown reception is ten percent of your total. Right. That's insane. Right. Yep, and you're probably going to get you're probably going to get one of those. At Correct. Least. So that should help you out. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, I'm taking a look. We talked a little bit about him earlier. Um, I've got Emmanuel Sanders over four touchdown passes for the New Orleans Saints. A little bit of juice on that at minus 115 over there at points bet. Um, just to break it down, the season Michael Thomas had last year with his incredible yards and incredible uh, number of catches, he had just nine touchdown passes, which really puts Moss, what did Moss have, 23 with Brady? Uh, he broke 20. I, I don't even remember. I think he had 21 that, or 22, I think. Puts that ridiculousness in perspective. Um, but uh, anyway, so when Thomas had nine, uh, Jared Cook had nine, Traquan Smith had five, and uh, Breeze and Bridgewater threw 36 between them. I think Emmanuel Sanders has certainly going to be able to uh, hit that number. He's going to be the second option there uh, for Drew Breeze, and they're certainly going to – uh, concentrate the coverage of the defensive backfield, most likely uh, uh, having uh, Thomas, uh, if not double covered, at least have a safety over the top. I think you're going to have a lot of opportunities for Emmanuel Sanders uh, to get there and uh, put some touchdowns on the board. What do you think about uh, Emmanuel Sanders' four touchdown passes? Well, I was going to say, when you say touchdowns, does that include – is that only <laughs> receiving touchdowns? Yes, it's, it's actually it's, it's actually total touchdowns. I went back and double-checked well, so that. So. potential reverses and – Correct. Okay. Correct. It's so, not just it's not just passes. Yeah, you know, I'd actually lean to the over on that. Also, you said four was the number. Four. Four is the number. Okay. What's what's the juice on the over on that? One fifteen. Uh, I'd have to take the over as well. Uh, all the yeah. reasons, all the reasons you just said with Michael Thomas just getting most of the attention. Are the Saints good at running the ball? 
I mean, I guess a little bit. Latavius Murray tends to be their big down back guy after Mark Ingram left. But for the most part, the Saints are, a, I'd say, a pass first team based on how they've been wired the last couple of years. And right. Sanders should have one-on-one coverage. He's still a veteran. He knows how to beat man-to-man coverage. He's also going up against number two corners after facing number one corners with Denver and well, with Denver and San Francisco Denver, last year. Yeah. So he should be able to have that matchup. Plus, Sanders can potentially take a reverse or so. It is an option. And it also was worth mentioning that with the 49ers last year, he did throw a touchdown pass. So yeah, there's a chance that they can run a trick play here and there because you know that Sean Payton likes to be creative. There is a chance that maybe Emmanuel Sanders throws one. And if I that goes towards the four, that's just extra icing on the cake right there. I don't think that, I don't think that counts. That's why, it said total touchdowns. That's why I was asking. Yeah. Yeah, it does say total touchdown. So I, maybe they would count a touchdown pass. I would assume they would count touchdown pass. I would think they would count touchdowns scored. Yeah, of course. I thought about that. Yeah. I knew he threw one last year. Yeah, of course it is worth mentioning that you shouldn't be banking on a touchdown pass. You know, no. Emmanuel Sanders. But if that does count, you know, then why not? But overall, if Trey Quan Smith caught five last year. And right. You know, people, I mean, realistically, Emmanuel Sanders should probably finish with – if I had to guess, I'd say somewhere around six or seven. Yes, I think six or seven is the, is the right number there. So, yeah, I like Emmanuel Sanders over the four touchdowns. Uh, what else you got down here, Scotty? Okay, so looking at some other uh, just yardage here, uh, there's a lot to go around, and we're sticking to the NFC. I had a couple of favorites for the AFC. Um, sorry, let me just look through this really quickly. Um, one team that I'm actually going to be looking at for – uh, the over-under is going to be on DJ Moore from the Carolina Panthers. And I simply just think this number is a bit too high. So for that reason, I'm going to take the under. Foxbet has the number at 1249.5 at minus 110 on both sides. I just think that number is too high. And last year, Moore played in 15 games. He finished with 1175. I know that he didn't really have the greatest quarterback play there. I just – I don't – there's something about Teddy Bridgewater where it's kind of similar to why I wasn't the biggest fan of looking at Allen Robinson, where I know that I know that Trubisky is significantly worse than Teddy Bridgewater, but I always view Teddy Bridgewater as being more of a game manager, and I don't really think he's the kind of guy who's going to sling the rock downfield 50 yards and change at a time. He's kind of a nickel and dime it down the field kind of guy, and I feel like that's going to be an issue for Moore. Moore was the number one receiver last year, but they also brought in Robbie Anderson who should take the top off the defense as more of a deep threat. I think Moore might catch a lot of passes underneath, but at the end of the day, he missed, he missed the game last year, so health has been a bit of a concern so far in his young career. 11.75 last year, and now he's projected 12.50. I just think that's too high, and I still think McCaffrey's going to get the ball a ton. We both know that. I think Robbie Anderson should take some touches away. I know they lost Greg Olson, so you have to wonder about that, but as a whole – it's a little bit dangerous. It's not one of my favorite plays on the board, but I do think that number's too high. I think he'll finish around 1,100 again. So for that reason, I like the under. Yeah, and he was, uh, after, after bursting on the scene there in his rookie season, averaging 14.3 uh, yards per reception, uh, that was down almost a full yard last year as he went for just 13.5. I don't think that, I don't think that number gets any higher, with, like you said, with, the, with Teddy Bridgewater. He's not exactly checked down Charlie, but he does – uh, tend to lean towards the safer option as far as throwing the ball down the field. He's a good zone splitter, but he's not a guy that's going to, uh, you know, heave the ball 40 or 50 yards down the field on a consistent basis. I like, uh, I like that. I like that play. I think that's, I think that's solid. I don't see, uh, especially if you've got, if you've got an injury concern, I don't necessarily think he's in a position to put 75 yards automatically on last year's total. By the way. I'll yeah. go with you there again. It wouldn't be uh wouldn't be something I'd stand in line overnight to make that bet, but I I, I like it pretty well. Mm-hmm. I think that's I think that's a solid play. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, so I'm gonna take a look at a tight end here, and it's not going to be Gronk. It is going to be George Kittle out there in San Francisco. Uh, I've got the number on Kittle at uh, ten seventy five and a half. I like this a lot. It's uh, he put up uh, thirteen seventy seven in uh, two thousand eighteen. He was injured a couple games last season. He got to just ten fifty three. But, uh, you know, basically, this guy's an elite tight end in the league. If, if not the best, he's certainly the second best tight end in the league um, behind Travis Kelsey. 
He gets about eight targets a game. He averages just under six catches per game. Uh, last year he had 87 catches, 15 games, uh, 12.3 yards per catch. Uh, over his career, he's averaged 13.6 yards per catch. That is an incredible number for a tight end. I like uh, George Kittle to still be uh, an integral part of this the, uh, offense, especially with Emmanuel Sanders uh, not available for the Niners this season after moving on to the New Orleans Saints. Uh, give me – Give me some Kittle. Give me some Kittle over 1075 and a half. Yeah, I got the same number here. I also like the over. Uh, pretty much the same exact reasons that you just said. The question is, Shannon's offense is very based on – is heavily based on timing and, you know, making the right reads and everything. And, of course, Kittle should be read one on pretty much every passing play. But the question here is that to replace Emmanuel Sanders, you brought in a rookie who's coming off off-season surgery – who has no familiarity with the playbook. You also trade a Marquise Goodwin. So you lost some of your experienced receivers with the playbook. So I think the timing might be a little bit off with some of the younger guys early on. I mean, you still got Dante Pettis who might come back from injury, but he's, you know, what is he, a wide receiver three at best, give or take. You don't really have a go-to guy. I think when in doubt, when the going gets tough, you got to go to Kittle. Sure. And at the end of the day, I think Kittle, for that reason, I think he is the best tight end in the entire league all around. I think if Kittle played for Kansas City instead of Kelsey, I think Kittle would put up either the same or even better numbers than Kelsey. So I think that Kittle's the better tight end. But realistically, when healthy, Kittle should probably go for 1,200 yards. So for me, I would take the over. Yeah, I think it's just going to be a question of uh, injury with Kittle. I think, I think as long as he stays healthy – uh, even even for 15 games, uh, I think that he's going to be able to uh, certainly exceed that total of 1075. So, um, man, we're about running. I'm about running out here on my list. What do you got? To, what do you got left? You got you got one left? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm still looking to try to find the best line that I could find this at. Uh, okay. But, okay uh, what do I like here? Um, okay, yeah, I'm I'm gonna take one more. Uh, just, yeah, we're kind of running out here, but there is one that I do like based on the number available. And it currently is at 1099 and a half, uh, with more juice to the under than the over. I actually like the Cooper cup over 1099 and a half at minus one Oh five on Fox bet. I know that we're both not fans of golf, but cup last year played 16 games off of a torn ACL the previous year. And he went for 1161. Now the Rams also got rid of Brandon Cooks, so you have less targets out there, less mouths to feed. And I still think Cup's a very phenomenal receiver in terms of route running. I think he's fantastic. And I think at the end of the day, with Cooks not on the roster anymore and the fact that he went for 1161 last year anyway, I know that they might run the ball a little bit more this year in comparison, but Cup is by far Goff's favorite target. So for that reason, I think 1099 naps a little bit too low. Minus 105 on the over. I like the amount of reduced juice there. I'll take the over. Okay. All right. You know, I looked at that one and I I certainly, I certainly didn't, wasn't, had no, I had no interest in playing the under. Um, I'm probably not as, uh, probably not as confident in the over as you are, but I I don't think that's a terrible play. A gun to my head, I would, I would take Cooper Cup. And again, it's just a situation where you just don't have a ton of other options, you know. Um, they, uh, they, they do like to throw the ball, and they've definitely worked out uh, between golf and cup. Uh, they have worked out some chemistry there, and he is definitely his go-to guy. Uh, yeah, I think as long as Cooper Cup stays healthy, which he has had some challenges, but I think as long as he stays healthy, uh, I think there's a real good chance he gets to that 1,200 yards. So, quick question. Do you have any more plays that you like, or did you go through your short list already? I did. I got, I got one more. Okay, so how about you go through one, and then we'll table one that people want to talk about that neither of us have a strong opinion about. Okay, all right. Um, and this one, I was really torn on this one because I, I started writing this up, and I wrote it up as an under, and I actually changed my mind in the middle of writing it up, and that's Adam Thielen with the Minnesota Vikings. Okay. I uh, basically got the same number on him as I do have on Cooper Cup at 1,200.5 yards. Uh, Thielen has been – uh, remarkably consistent over his career. He's averaged 13 and a half yards per catch since joining the league. Uh, obviously, he was hurt last season, 
And the Vikings certainly uh, did themselves some favors on the receiving core, uh, taking Justin Jefferson in the first round and uh, K.J. Osborne out of the Miami in the fifth round. But those guys are going to suffer from lack of an offseason in a normal season. I'm probably all over the under here for Adam Thielen as those guys are going to get a lot of catches. But with no OTAs, with no chance at uh, any kind of training camp, I like Thielen to uh, take over his role once again as a wide receiver one. Not sure he's ready. Uh, he's been a wide receiver two, as I say, playing second fiddle to Stephon Diggs. But, you know, he's a tough kid. He's going to get those yards. And uh, if he averages 13 and a half uh, yards per catch, he just needs 90 catches to get there. And I think he can achieve that. Uh, personally, that's a no play for me. That's an easy no yeah. play. It's very tough. I get it. Yeah, you can go either way. The feeling going against cornerback twos his entire career and now going up against cornerback ones definitely doesn't help his case. I, actually, I know. I'm a huge Thielen guy, though. I think he is very talented. He had some injury issues last year, though, so durability might also play a factor in that total. Um, I agree with the lack of preparation on OTAs. If there was OTAs, I'd be all over Justin Jefferson, <laughs> who's currently in the 700s. I think that would be an absolute steal if there were OTAs. The also the question you have to wonder is we went through some of the schedules uh, for – we talked about the Vikings for a couple weeks. A lot of primetime games with Kirk Cousins there. So uh, you might have to worry about that potentially and some ah, ah. performances. But I like Thielen as a player, and I hope he, he performs well. A little bit too many question marks, a few too many, uh, just based on uh, Kirk Cousins as the quarterback with the lack of proper – wide receiver two depth and stuff like that. Jefferson should be good, but the question is if he'll be good immediately with a new playbook and a new system. In fact, the whole team's learning a new playbook because the fancy is gone. So you kind right. of have to remember how the timing will work there. I'm going to pass. That's one of those that I think if you wanted to take the over, it's because you like Thielen as a player, which I do. But there are a lot of variables that lean to the under there. So for me, it's a no play for me. All right. Well, that's and there's a reason he was at the bottom of my list. Like I said, I I started writing him one way and, and decided to go another way after after uh, actually getting a little deeper into his stats. So uh, that was there's a reason he was at the bottom of my sheet. So um, all right, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. What what do you got cooking over there? So that's pretty much it in terms of the value plays for me. There are a couple of receivers we didn't really touch upon because we didn't really think it was worth it. Like for example, Devontae Adams, Julio, because his numbers are going to be too high, stuff like that. But the one. Right. Where, yeah, the one player I wanted to ask you about, though, which is pretty much up in the air completely, which I know people want uh, our opinions about, DeAndre Hopkins. And I feel like it is definitely worth at least bringing up because he was by far the premium offseason acquisition, especially since he's switching conferences now from the AFC to the NFC. The number I have for him on Fox Bet is 1149 and a half. Okay. And I have no idea which way to lean here. And I felt like it was kind of worth tabling. I was curious what your thoughts were on Hopkins. I, I looked at that as well um, and decided to pass. But gun to my head, I'm going to have to play the over. I think Kyler Murray is, uh, is going to be better the second season. I think there's a huge learning curve between a quarterback's rookie season and their second season as far as being able to, uh, uh, to, to read defenses to check down correctly and find the open guy. And I think DeAndre Hopkins is a, just an unbelievable talent. You talk about over uh, underrated receivers. I think he is absolutely on that list. I would, uh, I'd, I'd go over here. Um, you know, like I said, it's not, there's a lot of, there's a lot of variables with this Arizona team, but um, yeah, I, I, I like, I, I, I have a lean to the, the over there. The only, the only question mark for me is incorporating into the new system with the short off season. That's, yeah. that's really it. For me, I'm actually going to disagree with you. <laughs> I, actually, I actually kind of like the under here. I think those numbers are a bit too high. Okay. Hopkins last year had 1,165 yards, missed a game. So he played in 15 games. He was the clear number one receiver in Houston with, with Deshaun Watson. I mean, you were throwing him with an injured Wolf Fuller all the time. I mean, he was injured all the time. And Kenny Stills, who was like, mid thirties feels right. like around for an attorney. So a lot of targets going his way. Now I'm not saying that Kingsbury is going to be an idiot and he's not going to realize, Oh, I got arguably the best receiver in the game. I'm not going to throw him the ball. 
But at the end of the day, Larry Fitzgerald's still productive. Is he the same guy he once was? No. But I think you can agree he should probably catch, what, 50, 60-plus passes, give or take? Yeah, I think you can certainly write him down for 50-plus. Yeah, him for 50 to 60-plus. And I'm still a huge Christian Kirk guy. I think Christian Kirk's a very underrated receiver. And I think when healthy, I think he can also get you 50 to 60 receptions. So, plus you also have to wonder I towards keep the end. waiting for that to happen. Yeah, plus – I'm just, I, I'm just saying I like Christian Kirk. But at the end of the year, when they were successful, I know. they also pounded the rock a little bit with Kenyon Drake. So they were not afraid to run the yeah. ball a little more. I agree that Hopkins is a phenomenal receiver. He's clearly a top three receiver in the league. I think you could argue that he's the best. I mean, now that Antonio Brown's gone, you could argue that he's the best with uh, either Michael Thomas or Julio. I feel like I, any order you want is fair game. But at the end of the day, he had 11.65 last year. He's currently at 11.49 and a half here, and the receivers on Arizona are significantly better in terms of depth than Houston's receivers last year. I think Hopkins will probably finish around 1,000 and change just because of how many other quality receivers are on the roster. So for that reason, I'm actually going to lean to the under here. I think Hopkins will have a very good year next year, but this year with a new system with a lot of other mouths before Larry officially retires, I'm going to take the under. I think this number is a bit too high. All right, I, I get the I get the touchdown logic behind that. Well, touchdown, and the one, you know, huh? touchdown receptions you can lean over. I just think yards are going to be a little bit tough to come by. Well, you know, the question that I have about Hawkins, and this is the reason that kept him off my list, um, after uh, putting up six seasons where he averaged about 14 yards per reception, he dipped to 11.2 yards per reception last season. He still had he still had 104 catches but he just didn't have the depth there. Um, and I just, that was the, that was the thing that kept him off my list. Like I said, I have a lean towards the over here just because he's talented. And I think Murray's going to be very good, but that is the stat that I came back to uh, more than the injuries because he still, even in 15 games still had 104 catches, which in any other season would have got in there. For example, in 2017, he had 96 receptions uh, for 1,378 yards. So uh, the number of receptions was there. I'm not really concerned about the injuries, but I do worry about that there may be just a little bit of drop-off in production. Maybe he's lost a step in his uh, after seven seasons in the NFL. So I certainly get the logic of playing the under. Like I said, they kept that's what kept him off of my list. But at the end of the day, I'm going to lean towards the over. So we have a, we have a slight disagreement there, smite, smite, a small leaning disagreement. Yeah, I mean, uh, personally, I wouldn't play it. But if I had to lean one way, I just think there are too many uncertainties. So for that reason, I would take the under. But, of course, you take the under, and then Hopkins has one game where he has eight receptions, 150 yards, and you're going to feel pretty stupid. So, you know, it, it, it's going to happen at some point. It's just a matter of if he can do it consistently enough to go over. But, uh, yeah, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on NFC receivers, but I feel like we've knocked a decent amount of them out. No, I did uh, – I took a look at uh, – I did take a look at Julio Jones over 1,400. That's so many yards. And, uh, anxious. That's so many yards. That's yeah, so I'm anxious to uh, – you know, I, I would probably le- I have a small lean towards the over. The only reason I put him on the list is because he's such a prolific receiver. Um, but there's only been uh, – last year was the first time in six seasons that he didn't get to 1,400 and he still got to 1,394. Uh, he still averaged 14 yards per catch. And I think that he gets the 100 catches. And that's, it's just working the math out on there. I think we both agree that Gurley is not going to be uh, the savior that they anticipate. And I think in, ultimately at the end of the day, uh, you're going to go back and lean on your, uh, your go-to guy and uh, Julio Jones. So yeah. I'm uh, anxious to get your thoughts on him. That's how I feel. So, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. – yeah, I feel like we pretty much covered them. So that's yep. Yeah, it was just that, that number. That number is just so huge. Um, and, you I, I know, there is that number is insane. Yep. So, all right, bud. Well, very good. We uh, look at that. Brought the show in in uh, in just about an hour, which is uh, which is record. yeah. That's that's Wait. pretty. It's pretty much. It's a it's a new record for at least the uh, the last couple of weeks. So we didn't have a, we didn't have seventeen fights to go through, and. Uh, with our UFC show yesterday, it was just, you know, when you put up a dozen fights, you want to do any kind of a breakdown at all, you know, your show is going to run, you know, it's going to run long. It's going to run over an hour. So, mm-hmm. 
anyway, so let's not let's not blow our time talking about how well we did. Uh, this has been the NFC receivers. Tomorrow we're going to do the AFC receivers, and uh, that should be fun as well. And like I said, we make sure you should get over there to winnersandwinners.com and check out Scott's pieces on the UFC fights coming on Wednesday night. A little uh, little hump day special. And, uh, yeah, we'll be back. Uh, we've got the whole week planned out. So we appreciate you guys joining us. Thanks for stopping by. As always, we want to hear from you in the comment section. Let us know you're out there. Let us know your types. What's your, what's your favorite NFC wide receiver bet? Tell us what it is, all right? Hey, for myself, for Scott Reichel, for all of us over, over here at winnersandwinners.com and statsalt.com, we thank you for stopping by. Tell your friends. Tell your neighbors. And uh, hang in there, guys. We're starting to get a little uh, – Starting to get a little positive movement, like we may have some sports here uh, after all in sometime in 2020. So uh, keep a good thought. Stay safe, everybody. We do appreciate you stopping by, and we'll see you tomorrow for the AFC wide receiver props. Until then, be healthy. Take care. Bye-bye.